This is the Philosophical Angle, and I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is the Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available free of, for viewing at www.philosophypublishing.com. Also along with me is uh, my panelist, Rick Samuelson, who graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton, an MA from Tufts, who's retired from the investment banking industry, and is now a private investor. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts and topics being used in current media and compare the essence with its usage and circumstances and how they are being used. Today the subject matter is going to be from an editorial in the Wall Street Journal a little bit ago called Bernanke's Cliffhanger which was in the journal on June 7th. Subtitled, The 2013 Fiscal Danger is a Tax Increase, Not Spending Cuts. I'm going to read selected paragraphs from the editorial to fill you in, and then Rick and I will discuss its import. Okay, here we begin. Second paragraph in the editorial. On Capitol Hill Thursday, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Mert Bernanke did not endorse one more round of monetary easing. But he did join the Keynesians' chorus, decrying a severe tightening of fiscal policy at the beginning of next year that is built into current law, the so-called fiscal cliff which would, if allowed to occur, pose a significant threat to the recovery. Those are Bernanke's words. The journal goes on and says, his recommendations to Congress, quote, I am telling you, try to avoid a situation where you have a massive cut in spending and an increase in taxes hitting all at the same time as opposed to spreading them out over time. Then the journal adds to his words in their characteristic sarcastic manner. They go, just what Congress needed, a lecture not to cut spending. Next paragraph in the, in the journal's ed editorial, it says, at least Mr. Bernanke got it half right. There are two distinct fiscal cliffs ahead. First, the rise in tax rates because the Bush reductions are set to expire under current law. This is dangerous and should be postponed pending a reform of the tax code. Next paragraph. The second cliff is the $1.2 trillion in automatic cuts in military and domestic discretionary spending over the next decade as agreed to in last year's debt ceiling deal. The depth of the defense cuts would damage national security, but the economic impact of all of those spending cuts would be benign, even beneficial. The idea that spending cuts will, will curtail the recovery is the same fiscal multiplier nonsense that gave us the $830 billion stimulus in 2009. And as some would, would say, actually not stimulus, some would say porculus. In a later edit, uh, paragraph, the editorial goes on to say, instead of a positive multiplier from the spending, the impact was close to zero. Harvard's Robert Barrow reports that in many cases, the multiplier from government spending is less than 1.0, meaning that greater spending tends to crowd out 
other components of GDP, mostly private investment. In the last 30 years, Congress has made two major efforts to reduce federal spending, and both times the economy performed well. At Ronald Reagan's urging, Congress passed a spending cut in 1981. A decade of historic growth followed. In 1994, Republicans took over Congress. Bill Clinton declared, the end, the era of big government is over. And spending was cut and began to fall as a share of GDP throughout the 1990s. The economy and stocks boomed, aided by a cut in the capital gains tax rate to 20 from 20 percent to 20 percent from 28 percent. Another paragraph in the editorial states, from 2000 to 2012, by contrast, federal spending has increased to 24% of GDP from 18.2%. And a durable recovery still hasn't arrived. Some government spending can be useful, aircraft carriers to win the Cold War, or new roads. But overall, it tends to be a big net drag on growth. Meanwhile, the cliff that could break the economy's neck is scheduled tax hikes. These include a tripling of the tax on dividends, a near 60% increase in capital gains rate, a 20% increase in personal income tax rates that will hit small businesses. The journal is talking about the tax increases that will happen on January 1st, 2013, without the extension of the Bush tax cuts. So they conclude that Bernanke's statement is really not too good and kind of Keynesian oriented. Just to, just to uh, summarize Bernanke's cliff, one, they state that the reduction of spend that uh, Bernanke uh, has uh, advocated reduction of spending. Okay, good. But Bernanke says that the reduction of spending along with tax increases is no good for the economy. Thus, perhaps this fellow is a Keynesian after all. Let's see. Let's see why. If we go here to our notes, we know that every economic decision has a sacrifice attached to it. And within that sacrifice is a risk. It's got information that you make in order to make your decision. You've got your time. You've got your effort. And if it's a, and if it's a material good, then you have material involved. So we have risk, knowledge, time, effort, and material. From this, we get a reward for our, uh, for our, for our, our ingredients. And then the government comes along and takes part of that reward. So you used to get a check, say, for $100 from your employer. The government comes along and takes part of that check. So you can't take your $100 entirely. OK, no problem. The government gets their fair share, I suppose. So add to that. And they get that through their tax increases or taxes. So if they increase their taxes, the government share of the reward will grow ever larger, and your reward will go ever lower. Well, what will, that, what will happen? Well, the government will be able to increase its spending. However, we all know that governments have an inefficiency that's inherent 
with its operation. In fact, I read uh, not too long ago that for every dollar that comes into the government welfare program, only 30 cents reaches the welfare recipients. That is a tremendous inefficiency. I wonder what the other departments are like. Worse? Better? So if there's a significant in inefficiency, that's a tremendous drag on the economy and the potential growth that's involved. Because once you get your reward, that reward goes into the economy. And if you have excess reward that you don't need right away, that goes to investments. And investment produce greater rewards. And what happens when you have other other reward from your investments. You need people to work those investments so that these investments create more jobs. In other words, your investment creates a profit. And without profit, there can be no jobs. So it is from profit that all jobs come about. So what is better? A full reward, maximum efficiency of the economy, which you, invest, which you can invest, which the economy invests and grows, gets a profit and, and, and hires more people. Or have government come in with its inefficiency, perhaps even 70-30, 70% inefficiency coefficient onto this little equation up here. That would be a huge drag on the economy. So. A philosophical angle disagrees with our statement up here by Bernanke. I could go to my uh, panelist, Rick. What are your thoughts on the subject? Well, uh, you know, Japan tried this uh, before in the 90s. They raised taxes. I, can't, I think it was a combination of sales tax and other taxes. Uh, and of course, the economy slumped right back into recession. Um, I mean, that's one recent example of an economy that was in a similar situation as ours, namely the aftermath of a, an enormous real estate bubble. Uh, so it's not as if these lessons haven't been learned in the past. Um, you know, the notion that we're ever going to get more tax out of this economy than roughly 18 or 19 percent of GDP has been disproven time and time again. Um, and yet somehow Mr. Obama thinks he's going to get 20 or 21 or 22 percent of GDP uh, raised in terms of taxes or certainly a higher number than 18 percent. And that 18 percent, by the way, extends back many years under all manner of progressive tax rates. It's, you know, the rich find a way not to pay taxes, and the lower 50% don't pay taxes. So if you don't have a growing economy, you don't stimulate it, the tax base remains stagnant or falls. So the answer is clearly not to raise taxes when we are on the verge of uh, possibly falling in recession. And again, uh, your point on government spending is, is uh, is well taken. The, the government transfers resources. It doesn't create GDP. It cannot create GDP. Uh, so the, to assume that the government, as this Keynesian administration seems to, can generate wealth out of nothing, that is to say government spending, is just it's nonsense. I agree. Do you think it has an implication to the stock market in the coming six months, or actually to the economy? Do you think the economy and, and probably its derivative of the stock market, which, is, which follows the economy, after all, the economy produces profits, corporations uh, uh, make those profits, and uh, if the corporations are not doing well and their profits are falling, uh, then the stock market will fall, certainly as uh, the stock market uh, likes to see profits in, in companies. So uh, what do you think, uh, 
What do you think it, it, this, uh, uh, this has uh, any effect for the coming six months in the economy? Well, probably over the summer, the stock market's going to be uh, pretty dull and, well, maybe dull is the wrong word. It will be volatile and it's probably not going to go anywhere. Uh, but I think that's fund fundamentally a, a, a response to where we are in the earnings cycle. Uh, that said, uh, you may find as the as the market begins to price in a Romney victory, and even notwithstanding the issues going on in Europe, because I think if Greece leaves the euro, it's going to be anticlimactic. You know, it's going to be frankly a relief to the market if that happens, uh, and there's probably a 50-50 chance it will. Uh, so you've got a combination of things going on here. You've got a you've got coordinated a coordinated well I would a simultaneous uh, slowdown across many economies in the world. Uh, you've got the uncertainty of the presidential election. I don't think market forecasters are yet pricing in a Romney victory. I think by September they will be. And that will be good for the market uh, because business-friendly policies will be introduced once again in the early part of next year. And the market's always looking six to nine months forward anyway. I think the price of gas has fallen, price of oil, um, or at least it's, it's not rising at the moment. And so that form of inflationary pressure has fallen away, and that's going to be good for the economy. Um, and you may well see that if there is some partial resolution to the European problem, and one or two countries go out of the euro, and then finally they consolidate on a smaller number of countries, uh, you could well see demand start turning up in the first part of next year and the stock market will begin to see that at the latter part of this year. You could easily, I think, and that's an optimistic scenario, frankly, but you could easily see if, if the situation breaks positively uh, that the market actually starts to recover before the end of the year and doesn't simply keep falling. And what about the tax situation? Uh, the taxes are going to go up on um, uh, on January 1st, and there have been several um, articles in the journal. One was uh, that was particularly fascinating was by Don Luskin that pointed out that the impact that this could have uh, on evaluation of stocks if this were allowed to, to happen. is It appears that uh, Congress will not allow a bill to extend uh, spending cuts or the, uh, the tax uh, cuts, the Bush tax cuts, uh, any further. And, that, and therefore, they probably will go into effect on January 1. Do you think... Yeah, but if they're spending cuts, so what? I mean, no, the tax increases. No, uh, the tax increases... Uh, but, well, but I think if Romney's elected, I think if Romney's elected, all bets are off. On the on extending or not extending the Bush tax cuts. Well, certainly he'll want to, but he'll have to. He'll need a, Dem a, a, a an entirely Republican Congress, or will the Democrats go along with it after January one? Uh, my my money is on the Republicans taking both the Senate and the House. They already have the House, but extending their lead in the House. That's where my money is at and, currently. And the Senate. Yes, the Senate. They will take the Senate. Okay, so they'll control both houses. Well, then they would be able to pass a retroactive tax uh, ex or, uh, tax relief extension. Um, however, what are the chances that they will uh, do the political pundits presently see that the election will produce a uh, a majority in Congress on both sides of the houses? 
in both houses? Uh, well, certainly the media don't, or they're not saying so publicly. Uh, I think the, the the messages, the articles I've read concerning the Senate in particular, are are kind of very hesitant to even suggest that the Republicans could take the Senate. Um, but, you know, working in a political campaign the way I do, I, I see a groundswell of uh, support for Republican candidates, even in a state like Washington, a traditionally blue state. I think the Democrats are going to be shocked by what happens here, uh, both with the congressional uh, candidates and even even possibly the Senate in Washington. Never mind. The governorship is already going to go Republican. That's almost a certainty. Okay. So you, you and for the first time in uh, 30 years, okay. right? So you feel that eventually the stock market and uh, will uh, will become to see have your perspective that the yeah. And I don't that's... think you know I don't think it'll take them long to figure out. I mean, once they even before the election results are in. And they see that a business-friendly environment is going to prevail in the United States. And as long as as Europe uh, kind of plods along and gets some partial resolution to their problem, uh, and, and with commodities prices being actually pretty uh, friendly at the moment, that doesn't mean to say that we won't see higher commodities prices in the next couple of years, but at the moment, commodities prices have, have been relatively tame, particularly oil. I think you have the makings there for, and interest rates, by the way, are pretty low. You have the makings for uh, a, a pretty robust investment and uh, economic growth environment, uh, certainly in the United States in the first instance, but elsewhere as well. I mean, if, it, if the United States starts growing, that's going to have a knock-on effect on China and uh, Brazil and other countries that ship products to us. I mean, you could see a virtuous a cycle start as early as the first part of next year. And I would say the stock market will see that happening six to nine months ahead of time. And what about the recessions that are gathering? They're, they're sort of gathering storms in Europe and Asia that are happening now with the the government's overspending and therefore uh, cannot pay their bills and there'll be a, a realignment of how people are paid in those economies because a lot of people on, uh, on, on uh, that were getting payments were probably going to have to take a decrease in their payments. Uh, uh, there's, their, their, their budget's going to have to be realigned and uh, spending cuts are made and and already the effects are being uh, uh, seen in the European arena. Do you think that uh, I, recessions I don't, I don't, are forming? Yeah, I don't, but I don't see Europe as one um, a monolith. Let, let's look. Let's talk about Germany for a second. Well, first of all, is all that right. Asia also happening? Uh, it's not a, a recession gathering uh, in in Asia. Well, yes, but let's. In, in specifically Europe's case, uh, let's talk about Germany for a second. Germany is, on all measures, a superior economy to the United States at the moment, on all measures. All right? Agree. Whether you're talking about unemployment, economic growth, the... Uh, Corporate the, tax, uh, tax structure. The tax structure, the flexibility of the, the job market. On all measures, it's a better economy. That's right. a fact. Yes. Okay. And by the way, it's the biggest economy in Europe. Right. By the way. And by the way, they are calling the shots. By <laughs> yes, the way. They are. Okay. If Germany doesn't agree with a policy, it will not happen in Europe. Period. Period. Okay. Good, good point. So uh, the problem for Europe is it's tr the various per peripheral countries are trying to maintain uh, a entitlement society that can't be sustained. And they're trying to maintain, uh, in some instances, a unified currency that can't be maintained. And so the stresses in Europe, 
and particularly the negative implications for the banks are what are causing all this problem. Okay. Once you recognize that those systems can't be maintained, and so actually the Germans are right. Austerity, austerity is the answer, uh, and write downs are the answer. Right. But the problem with the Europeans is they're trying to maintain this oligarchic, uh, supranational economic regulatory structure that's not working. Need to be somewhat broken down, um, and there needs there needs to be some exits from the euro. For there are certain economies that will never be able to live up to the standards required of the euro. That's known. Greece is an obvious example, and there are probably others. And I would say the market, if it sees some progress toward breaking down the supranational regulatory structure. And some exits from the euro, and also sees that Germany continues to call the shots. I think the market's going to be very happy with that if that's the kind of resolution they see. Okay, very good. And uh, I'd like to thank Rick for joining us and and uh, being with the philosophical angle. And we'll because uh, that about wraps it up for today. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.